Greetings everyone, today we gather here to discuss a depressing topic of fighting games that are no longer with us. Except they still are with us. You see, there's this constant discussion about fighting games that are either already dead or soon will be, but there's never any sort of consensus or clarity on what actually counts as a dead fighting game. Is there a specific number of players that makes it dead? There are dozens of us! Maybe it's more about the time it takes to find a match. Everyone seems to have a different criteria for it. But overall, there are usually two sides to this discussion. The necromancers, who think that nothing is ever truly dead, and grave diggers, who seem to have a deep desire to put everything six feet under. There's a nugget of truth to both of those viewpoints, so in this video we'll try to cover that while also explaining why both of these takes are kind of delusional. But before we begin, as always, clicking on that subscribe button is extremely appreciated and mutually beneficial. As you can see in these stats that I made up, everyone who subscribed to Dash Fight has experienced a terrifying surge of success. The hairline is advancing, their characters are getting buffed, and their brain is expanding to superhuman levels. Wow. So yeah, subscribe if you haven't and let's get back to the topic. Before we get to specific points, let's draw a general outline of what it means for a game to be dead. Most would probably conflate dead games with abandonware, multiplayer games that had their servers shut down, or single-player games that were taken from real or digital store shelves. But that's not the case here. When people call something dead, it basically translates to there's not enough players, or trying to play this game is too much effort. I think the easiest way to illustrate this issue would be to go to a game's life cycle and see how frustrations build up until reaching a point where the game is proclaimed to be deceased. There are plenty of real examples to work with here, but let's use a made-up game instead. Like, I don't know, let's say FND Duel. You like fighting games, and this one looks like it could be fun. You buy the game on release, and it picks out a respectable 10k plus players. This is the best time to play any fighting game. Everyone is new, and there are lots of people to play against, so you do exactly that, and for the next month or two, you boot up the game for a few casual matches. Unfortunately, as time goes by, the player count shrivels up. What used to be a few thousand players is now barely reaching into the four digits, and it's reflected in your experience. Finding matches requires more time, you tend to run into the same people more often, the skill gap between opponents becomes more noticeable, and good connections are not quite as common. But let's say you still enjoy the game. There's enough fun to put up with the inconvenience, so you keep playing. A month later, and the player count is just a few hundred people. Playing the game casually is not really a thing anymore. It has become a commitment. Keeping up with people who still play the game requires a decent amount of practice, and when you do want to play, you have to poke people on Discord or enjoy the eternal queue times. By now, you have to ask yourself, is this worth the effort? For the vast majority of players, the answer is... No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. No. No, no, no! Most of them don't even get to that last step. They see the player count dip below four digits and peace out. Why bother putting in all this effort when there are other games that don't have these obstacles? For what it's worth, this is where the game becomes dead for the average casual player. And in this case, casual describes anyone who isn't a hardcore fan of the game. The latter might find these complaints inconsequential and say something like, well, it's not dead, Discord is very active, or start talking about how much you could learn by fighting stronger players, which is definitely true, but not something that matters in this situation. Getting good is the goal of a dedicated player. Casuals just want to hop in and have a few fun matches. That's why, no matter how you feel about it, almost all of their complaints are completely valid. These expectations of just being able to play the game without any extra hassle apply to every video game ever made. There are developers whose entire job consists of figuring out how to make the player experience as frictionless as possible, because that's how you keep them playing. That's how you keep the game alive. Single-player games enjoy the luxury of being able to do whatever they want in this regard. It doesn't matter what your player count is when it doesn't impact the individual experiences in any way. With multiplayer, especially when PvP is concerned, that's not at all the case. This is something that the greater gaming industry had to learn roughly two decades ago. Initially, the novelty of being able to play a video game with other people over the internet was special enough to ignore any downsides. Fast forward a few years and now we have Halo 2, revolutionizing the online play by by introducing matchmaking, significantly streamlining the process of finding games and setting a new industry standard. Multiplayer games are thriving, but they're still competing with each other, so they kept trying to find new ways to attract and retain players. That's who got things like crank modes, seasonal ladders, unlocks, level up prestige. In other words, all those nice and shiny numbers and images that stimulate the goblin's brain to grind harder. Further cementing it were the regular patches and DLCs that were meant to keep the game fresh. 
Things probably would have kept going like that for a while, but in 2013 a terrible industrial accident at Valve led to some lines of code getting spilled and mixing together, which resulted in the creation of digital crack cocaine known as a battle pass. Here comes the money! Here we go! Money talk! This would eventually become the blueprint for the life service model that became so effective at keeping people coming back. Whether this evil is necessary or not is up to you to decide, but the results are undeniable. For some reason, giving people less and making them work harder for it helps to make them come back and play your games. Extrinsic rewards are a hell of a drug, I guess. Anyway, you might be asking, what is the point of all this? Fair question. I didn't do the best job of leading from one thing to another. The point is, when people complain about a dead game, they usually list out symptoms and not the cause. We all know what happened. What matters is why it happened. There is no use to complain about people calling the game dead. Instead, you have to consider, what did developers slash publishers do to foster the interest in their game? And then retain the player base. Because chances are, there were plenty of mistakes along the way, like a bad launch, lack of updates, poor marketing, or releasing a fighting game in 2024 without rollback netcode. What were they thinking, man? We always try to be fair though, so we have to point out that people who get mad about games being called dead also have a point, a really good one at that. First of all, let's just say that not everyone who says that such and such games are dead is trying to be reasonable or make any sort of worthwhile argument. A lot of the time it's just tribalistic assholes who want to gloat about games they don't like by implying that low player count equals bad game. Then there's also the people who have no clue how fighting games work. Your average gamer is used to seeing player counts measured in tens if not hundreds of thousands. So when they see something like this, they mistakenly think that it's not a lot or somehow bad. Not only do they potentially deprive themselves of playing a good game, but they might also scare away of other potential newbies. Imagine trying to check out a game that looks kinda interesting, but then you see the feedback and it's people saying that it's dead or will soon be abandoned. Not exactly encouraging, is it? It's easy to see why fans of the game would be upset about it. They have to deal with both haters praying for the game's downfall and clueless people who think that you need thousands of players to enjoy a fighting game. Numbers never hurt, of course, but but fighting games don't need 10 or more players to start a match, so you need far fewer people to facilitate solid matchmaking. It's obviously harder in some regions, but generally anything over 1000 should be golden, and anything over 5 to 600 is still decent as long as you're in one of the more active regions. I thought you were dead. My death was greatly exaggerated. But for this video, I specifically wanted to point out the logic behind games never die mentality, that as long as there is another player, the game goes on. That's obviously an exaggeration, and yet you'd be surprised how few people you need to have fun. As long as you're willing to take a risk, you could find something special, something that you might treasure for the rest of your life. I could go with a personal example of getting into Third Strike on Fightgate. Even though there were maybe a few dozen players that I could get a decent connection with, and only a few were fellow beginners, it was more than enough to get constant matches and long sets. Eventually this led to getting invited into a small community server where I found new friends, who not only made learning the game more fun, but also helped me to enjoy other fighting games. Everyone probably had some something like this happen in their life. It doesn't even have to be a fighting game. Sometimes we just find a game, a movie, a book, or even a song that just really speaks to us and becomes a lifetime favorite. We all have those special things that we love deeply, so why do so many people gatekeep themselves from finding more things like this? Money is obviously always something to consider, but everything else just seems like an excuse. Especially when you consider just how welcoming and passionate these smaller communities tend to be. If you do enjoy the game, these people are a godsend, because they will help you in any way they can, at no gain of their own, simply because they love the game and they want you to feel the same joy that they do. Finding matches might still be an inconvenience, but it varies quite a bit from game to game. For example, a lot of these groups tend to have beginner roles to facilitate matchmaking between newbies, and some even run beginner to intermediate tournaments to encourage and celebrate new players which is honestly just amazing. Within actual games, you will also have to switch to searching for open rooms instead of opting in for matchmaking. It might sound a bit tedious, but it's not that bad. Unfortunately, not every game can be a Guilty Gear Plus R, where everyone is just in one big lobby. This game tends to hover at around 200 players, yet you will probably find matches faster than you would in any of the recent fighters with massive player counts. Same goes for Fight K2, at least most of the time. Of God. 
After looking at both perspectives, it should be obvious that both just want to play fighting games and enjoy them. But both suffer from misunderstandings and unwarranted concerns. Do you love fighting games? If you're still listening to this, the answer has to be yes. So the next time you see something you find interesting, just go ahead and give it a try. No matter what, the best time to do it will always be now. Go out there, give the games a chance, ask for help if you need it. You could be missing out on one of the best experiences in your life. If you're already a hardcore fan, ignore the assholes who just wanna dunk on the games they don't like and focus on people who are genuinely interested. You could gain a new community member and even a friend. Thank you for watching the whole video and enduring the bad voiceover. I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments. See you next time.